welcome to this service from Lower Maclay Anglican Church on the very friendly mid-north coast of New South Wales. My name is Katie Peakin and I want to thank you for watching today. We've heard a lot, haven't we, over the past months about how unprecedented the current situation is and it certainly has been and is still a very challenging, stretching and difficult time for a lot of us. Even if we're pretty laid back people, it's hard work when almost everything you do on a daily basis has to be done differently now. If you're like me, you found some things about coronavirus and all the restrictions and shutdowns really hard, but there have been some unexpected positives. And I would love to know what positives you found in the middle of this unprecedented time. So please leave me a message, you'll find um, a link or a button underneath this window that you can click on and it will take you to a feedback form. I would love to know that you watched and I'd love to know what you have found unexpectedly positive about the current situation. But how do you handle it when bad news just keeps coming and almost every plan you might have made has to be rethought or maybe cancelled altogether and it's suddenly so obvious that you're facing problems that you can't control. That's what our guest speaker, David Roger Smith, is going to talk about today. And he's going to show us how knowing who Jesus really is totally changes how we cope with the tough times. Now, when this service comes online, I will be on leave, but Michael Bain is leading our physical services at nine o'clock on Sunday mornings at Holy Trinity Southwest Rocks. So if you would like to go along to a physical service, you can book in online, and the link for that is under this window on YouTube or on our webpage. Or if you prefer to talk to a real person, you can register to go to that service by calling the mobile number that's on your screen right now. And our very friendly representative will take your call and reserve a seat for you. You can join in those live services by Zoom, and there's a link for that under this window as well. Now, at one point, Jesus asked his disciples, his followers, what they were hearing from the crowds. Who did they think Jesus was? They told him, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. We're going to hear a song that explains what being the Messiah meant. You might like to join in. It's called Jesus Messiah. Oh 
ransom us because every one of us is guilty of sinning against God of failing to give him the place in our lives that rightly belongs to our Creator God says oh that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commands always so that it might go well with them and their children forever but we don't have that fear, that respect for God. We take him for granted and all the good things that he does for us and gives us. And we don't obey his commands. The good news of Jesus, the Messiah, is that God loves us in spite of our disrespect. He invites us to admit our sin and receive his forgiveness and his welcome home. So let's do that right now. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have broken your holy laws and have left undone what we ought to have done. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son, who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, God doesn't take pleasure in people's mistakes and he doesn't want anyone to die. He wants everyone to turn to Christ and live. God pardons everyone who humbly repents and truly believes that they are forgiven because Jesus died for them. If that's you, know for sure that through Jesus Christ you have peace with God. Amen. So give thanks to God, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. God tells us to sing and make music to him. So will you join in this next song and praise him for his kindness? This is called Desert Song.
A few weeks ago, we heard from Glenn MacDonald. He's one of the field staff for the Bush Church Aid Society, BCA, uh, and he leads a church in Roxby Downs in South Australia. Now, this is what BCA's website says. Bush Church Aid has a heart for people living in remote and regional Australia. We're committed to going the distance to reach Australia for Christ. People living in sparsely populated areas often don't benefit from strong support networks. Churches in these areas can struggle financially due to fluctuating populations. Ongoing fellowship can be hard to maintain and encouragement can become a rarity. In partnership with Anglican dioceses across the country, Bush Church Aid places committed and gifted Christians in a variety of locations to help people connect with the grace of God revealed in Jesus. Well, today I'm delighted to have David Rogers Smith teaching and encouraging us. David is the Regional Officer for Queensland and Northern New South Wales. He and his wife, Julie, visited us last year, which was so encouraging for us. And I'm sure you will be encouraged by what he has to say today. Before we hear from David, I'm going to pray that God will speak to us through the words of the Bible and through David's teaching. Let's pray. Gracious and generous God, as the Bible is read and taught to us today, may your spirit of truth speak clearly to each one of us. Remind us of the truth we already know and reveal to us truth we've not yet grasped so that we are able to obey Jesus' words. Produce in us the fruit of your spirit so that our words and actions will bring you glory. Amen. Well, today's reading is from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Your wife comes home from work and says, I don't love you anymore. I'm leaving you on Thursday. Your oncologist says it's a malignant tumour and your chances are 50-50. Your GP says your husband has dementia and it's downhill from here. You're 63 out of work and no one wants to hire you. President Trump gets re-elected for another term. They're saying that the droughts will be longer, fiercer and more frequent. You've done shameful things and God's judgment is coming. How do you react when things spiral out of control? or seem hopeless, with undignified panic, crippling fear, insomnia-inducing worry, spiritual depression, straight on the phone to Lifeline because they care? And what about when you finally learn, as most of us have this year, that you were never in control to start with? What then? I'm going to retell a story from the Bible and then ask four questions. All this is aimed at answering the astoundingly important questions. Who is Jesus? And in this crazy broken world, how does he expect me to respond to that? To him? Are you with me? Will you stay with me? 
please open your Bible to Mark's Gospel, an eyewitness account of the life of Jesus Christ, written within just a few decades of his life. We're in chapter 4, and please see in verse 1 we're told that Jesus began to teach by the lake. That's the Sea of Galilee in the north of the Roman province of Judea. The crowd that gathered around Jesus was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake. While all the people were along the shore at the water's edge, and there he taught all day. Now here's the story from later in the chapter. Please, for now, just listen. In the evening of that day, Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross over to the other side of the lake. They left the crowd behind and took Jesus in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. A great windstorm blew up, and the waves were breaking into the boat. It was fast filling up. But Jesus was in the stern, the back of the boat, asleep on the cushion. They woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care that we're perishing out here? He got up rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Quiet, be still. The wind stopped and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were terrified and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? My first question to you is, What do you like in that story? I'm sure many of you liked the detail in the story. We're told it was evening, that it was a hasty departure, that other boats joined them, that when the storm hit, Jesus was in the stern. And Mark doesn't only tell us that Jesus was asleep, but that he was asleep on a cushion. These are the details of an eyewitness. Could we still get the point of the story without being told the detail? Yes, we could. So why is it there? I think one reason is to underline that this really did happen, just like this, with real people in a real boat with a real cushion. This first century fishing boat was found on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. It's dubbed the Jesus Boat. They were small, weren't they? Those on board were very vulnerable. What else did you like in the story? How about Jesus telling the wind and the waves what to do, and they do it? How impressive is that? Have you ever been in a small boat in a storm? I have. On Jarvis Bay on the New South Wales south coast. We were about halfway across the bay, heading seaward on a nice sunny afternoon, And out of nowhere, this furious squall came up, whipping up crazy, dangerous waves. What do you think the captain did? I can tell you what he didn't do. He didn't stand up at the back of the boat, put his arms out like this, and tell the wind to cut it out. Thankfully, he was sane. He carefully turned the boat around and headed back to shore. And it was hairy and scary all the way. But Jesus did tell the storm to stop, and he wasn't out of his mind. How do we know that? Because it did stop. And here's another thing in the story to like. Did you notice it? Jesus orders the waves to stop. If he just stopped the wind, we'd still be in awe. But the angry sea as well. This is total control of the creation. That's scarier than the storm, don't you think? What do we learn about people, ourselves? Can you see yourself in that boat? You're not in control, are you? Instead, you're freaking out. Brings you back to earth, doesn't it? We all had our plans for 2020, Work plans, a new business, a special event, family occasion, a wedding, a big trip. What happened to our plans? They are either shelved or changed. Why? Because we're not in control. 
control is an illusion. A new virus escapes from a wet market in a city 8,000 kilometres away and our whole world is capsized like a flimsy little boat. In Isaiah, God announces that there are six things he hates, seven things that are detestable to him. Remember what the first one is? Pride. Now that's a serious problem for us because we're all afflicted with it. And Jesus said, unless you become like a little child, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. That requires humility, dependence and trust. I've always remembered a preacher saying, whatever humbles you is good for you. The storms that come and whip up danger for us. They are God's severe mercy. A pandemic, a serious illness, missing out on a job, a divorce, a death. You add in there the storm you're in or have just come out of. These things are God's severe mercy. They teach and remind us that we're not in control. And that's very humbling. And whatever humbles you is good for you. You need humility to get into the kingdom and stay in the kingdom. Don't waste the storms. Let them humble you and put you in your place and God in his place. We're not in control. What else does this story show us about ourselves? What about this? We're quick to accuse God of not caring. The disciples woke Jesus and said, Teacher, Don't you care that we are perishing? Now I get that they're panicking. But do you think they're also being a bit unfair? After all, Jesus was asleep. Imagine a spouse waking their partner at 2am yelling, Don't you care that I'm having a heart attack? There's a few storms raging around the world at the moment. A pandemic widespread persecution of Christians, civil and political unrest. There's probably one hitting you right now. If not, it's on its way. It's one thing for an unbeliever to accuse God of not caring. They don't get what God's up to. But we Christians ought to know better, unless we're new believers or biblically illiterate, in which case we need to grow up into maturity. And do you know one of God's most effective training strategies for that? Storms, trials, tribulations. What we need to do is cooperate with God and his ways. Embrace our trials in him and him in our trials. Embrace our trials in him and him in our trials. Do you think that vicious windstorm on that lake that night was random? Not on your life. It was a necessary part of the disciples maturing, learning more about who Jesus is, learning to set their anchor down in him. So what do we learn about Jesus from this story? Did you wonder why he alone was asleep? He would have been exhausted after a very long day's teaching. I've got nothing left in the tank after preaching two or three times on a Sunday. He taught all day. Are you in ministry? Jesus knows the exhaustion of ministry's endless demands. He also knows hunger and thirst, loneliness and rejection, temptation, mental anguish, shocking physical pain. This is why Jesus is such a perfect priest and shepherd for his people. He understands and empathises with our humanity. And more than that, He's able to help us in our weakness and difficulties. How do we know that? Let's work it out together from the story. Jesus gets up from his sleep, rebukes the wind and speaks to the sea. Quiet! Be still! The wind stops and Mark says, literally, there was a great calm. There's two things here that give us insight into who Jesus is. His action and the disciples' reaction. Jesus orders the wind and waves to be quiet and to stop. Now, just stopping the wind would have been miracle enough, but the waves as well? 
This is an immediate, all-powerful overruling of nature's destructive forces. In the Old Testament, Psalm 107 verse 23 says, Others went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm. And he guided them to their desired haven. And back in Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, in the synagogue in Capernaum, we're told that Jesus is confronted by a man possessed by an evil spirit. If you've got it open there in chapter 1, verse 25, Jesus responds using the same language he'll later use in the storm. Mark says, literally, But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. Let's put both incidents together. Jesus demonstrates an immediate, overwhelmingly powerful overruling of both the spiritual and natural world, total control of destructive evil, disorder and chaos. In the synagogue, the people are amazed and ask each other, What is this? In the boat, the disciples ask each other, Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Who indeed? Jesus had rebuked the wind and sea. Now he mildly rebukes the disciples for not trusting him. Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? Jesus clearly expects them to have faith in him. Do you think he's being a bit hard on them? After all, isn't religious faith a leap into the unknown? And in the storm, the leap is just too great? Not Christian faith. Faith in Jesus is evidence-based. That's why we have these eyewitness accounts. The disciples had already witnessed Jesus perform astonishing miracles. They had good reason to trust that they were in safe hands. Jesus' mighty action in that moment prompts a reaction that gives us more clues about who Jesus is. Mark closes his account with this. He says literally, and this is very important, And they were afraid with a great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? It's like they've not heard Jesus' rebuke. They're just so afraid of him that instead of answering, they ask each other, Who the heck is this? Do you know why else I gave you the literal rendering of the disciples' reaction? It's word for word exactly the same reaction of the shepherds. You know, when the glory of the Lord appeared to them to announce the birth of the world's Saviour, Christ the Lord. I quote, And they were afraid with a great fear. You see, the shepherds then and the disciples now are in the immediate presence of God. Not trusting him in the storm wasn't a good reaction. But I think fearing him with a great fear is a better one. Don't you think? In the NIV, the literal language is somewhat obscured. Mark refers to a great windstorm, a great calm and a great fear. The fear was equal to the calm, which was equal to the storm. Do you know how Mark opens his gospel? The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And you see, what follows is the evidence. So when you reach chapter 15, Mark has you standing at the cross of Jesus. And there's also a Roman centurion standing there. And when he sees the way Jesus died, the centurion says, I quote, Surely this man was the Son of God. That's who Jesus is. And his action on that boat and the disciples' reaction provide some important evidence. 
Jesus is unique. He's both fully human and fully God. There was no one else like him before him. There's been no one since, not even close. Can you think of one? Little wonder our calendar is dated from his birth. We finish with the obvious question, what does the story want us to do? The most obvious answer is, know that Jesus Christ is the unique Son of God and Son of Man. The New Testament says that as man, Jesus understands and feels our weaknesses. Feels! So we must take ourselves in hand and reject self-pity and thinking that God doesn't understand or care. They are destructive lies. Instead, do what God invites us to do. Draw near to Jesus. Pour out your heart to him because he cares and feels. And the New Testament also affirms that because Jesus is God, he is able to help us. I have an inflammatory bowel disease and I find comfort in sharing my struggle with fellow sufferers. They understand my struggle and they feel it, but they can't help me. If Jesus can immediately stop a furious storm, he can help us in and with whatever comes to us. We're only four chapters into this gospel and Jesus has shown us that he has total authority over the devil, disease, disability, forgiveness of sins and the weather. Quiet! Be still! And the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Let this Jesus quiet you and still your fears. Why has God given and preserved for us this event in the life of Jesus? Because he wants you to know that Jesus is his son with all authority. Why? So that you'll trust him. Trust him as your refuge in the judgment to come. And what a storm that will be. Trust him to be in control of demons and disease and disability and downturns and droughts and dictators and death. And yes, your day to day. He isn't controlled by circumstances around you. He controls the circumstances for your good and his glory. If Jesus is the Son of God with all authority, our lives should be marked by faith, not fear. So what will it be for you, knowing Jesus as just Son of Man or as both Son of Man and Son of God? What will it be for you, timidity, fearfulness and faint-heartedness or faith, courage and confidence? C. H. Spurgeon is helpful here. A little faith will bring your soul to heaven. Great faith will bring heaven to your soul. He said that in the midst of deep depression. Do you find it remarkable that evil spirits, wind and waves obey Jesus, but we don't? Come on, be honest. What are you holding out on with Jesus at the moment? What disorder, dysfunction or disobedience do you need to surrender to Jesus? Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet. Or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Quiet, be still. And the wind stopped and there was a great calm. This year an Aboriginal sister in Christ shared this with me. Last night God revealed to me that we need to leave the big obstacles to him. When the women were going to Jesus' tomb to prepare his body, the big obstacles were removed. The stone was rolled away, the guards weren't there, and neither was the body. You think about that. Amen. We can trust Jesus with the big obstacles because he is the God of compassion. 
This next song is all about that. It's called The Compassion Hymn.
Apostle of Jesus says, The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. We're going to spend some time now presenting our requests to God. Anne has prepared our family prayers for us today. Let us pray. Creator God, we offer you our thankful praise for our world, our universe, our land for all its riches and the many blessings of life which we are part. We praise you for the salty seas and fresh running waters, for the mountains, trees, flowers and grass under our feet. We thank you for our senses, the splendour of the morning, hearing the jubilant song of birds and the fragrant smell of the garden. Grant us a heart wide open to all this joy and beauty and save us from being too weighed down by our present circumstances that we fail to appreciate your glory. Lord, we thank you most of all for the beauty and glory of our salvation and the promise of your word. Most merciful God, the generosity of your love is astounding to us. In confidence and trust, we bring to you our prayers for your people. Your love reaches out to all your children. Hear our prayers for your world and its people. We pray for the nations affected by war, natural disaster, hatred, violence, injustice and the global pandemic. We pray for those injured or killed with the explosion in Lebanon. Be with their leaders. Give them wisdom and resolve as they deal with this along with the COVID pandemic. We pray for Pap Papua and New Guinea and give thanks we are able to send medical aid to help with the COVID virus as they have limited health system. Teach us how to love each other as you have loved us without distinction of race or colour. Ever loving God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, our State Premiers. Give them wisdom and energy as they navigate this season. Let your hope and truth guide their actions. We pray for the people of Victoria and the severe lockdowns imposed on them and the continuing spread of the virus. Come rescue and restore them from this virus. Lord, you have not given us a spirit of fear, but one of love, power and sound mind. So we keep our eyes on you, Lord, with every challenge we face and the challenges before us as a nation. Protect and strengthen the brave people serving others on the front lines of this pandemic. We pray for our nation that we will come back to our Creator God in a true spirit of re repentance. Your word says, If my people who are called by na my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Eternal God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Unite your global church. Increase our generosity, faith and love for those around us. Continue to transform us. Let the spirit of renewal we've experienced strengthen our resolve to share your hope. As our church buildings are able to open for worship, Give us patience and love for each other as we adjust to the new regulations imposed. We give thanks for technology and the tenacity of our church leaders that has allowed people to connect and with the many ways to worship together and your word being heard. We pray for Katie as she is having a much earned holiday break. Give her rest and fun to rejuvenate her for the ministry you have called her to. We pray for Michael, who has taken over the helm during Katie's leave. Bless him with strength and energy for his ministry. Teach us to love each other as you have loved us, without regard to creed or practice. Eternal God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer for, this community, for the people of this community, for our families, our friend and ourselves. We pray you continue to heal those who are sick and protect those who are not. We pause for a moment to pray for those who are on our hearts.
Encourage anyone feeling anxious, afraid or helpless. We pray for our families and friends, especially those who don't know of your love and mercy, to hear and be convicted by your word. Teach us to love each other as you have loved us, welcoming both friend and stranger. Eternal God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember those who have given their lives that others may live, the saints and martyrs and all your faithful people. Teach us to love each other as you have loved us, that following your commandments we may be numbered among your friends and abide forever in your love. Eternal God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Please join in praying together the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. If we belong to Jesus, he has given us a job to do, a mission. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. It's important that we put as much effort into fulfilling that mission as we do into every other aspect of following Jesus. Nothing matters to Jesus more than people believing in him and so receiving forgiveness and eternal life. So let's pray for that now. Heavenly Father, mighty Lord and Saviour, we know that your dearest desire is for people to come to know you, to receive your love, your forgiveness and your life. Father, we have been given the words of eternal life. We've been given the antidote to death. So we pray now for the people that we know who are on the front line, who are sharing the message of Jesus with people who have never heard it or have heard but not understood or have understood but not yet believed. We pray for our friend working for CMS in a country where the Christian message is not welcome. We ask you to help her become equipped with the language and a knowledge of the culture so that she is able to take the opportunities that come her way to explain the good news of Jesus. We pray for Glenn MacDonald, leading the community church in Roxby Downs. We ask that you will open doors for the message in that town and we pray that you'll give Glenn the words so that he is able to explain clearly. We pray for David Rogers Smith and his wife Julie as they support both field staff and the churches who support the Bush Church Aid Society. And for us too, Lord, make us ready and willing to chat with people about Jesus. You've called each one of us to be priests whose job is to make you known to the world. Please, God, fill us so full of confidence and joy in Jesus and in the wonderful future that you have promised us that we can't help it spilling over as we talk to people. Well, let's take 10 seconds now and name to God the friends, family, co-workers, neighbours that we long to see put their faith in the Lord Jesus. Lord, we ask you to reveal yourself to these people so that they may receive the precious gift of life that you have given to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. When Peter said he believed that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus told him it was God who had revealed that truth to him. He said, I tell you that you are rock, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not overcome it. Well, Jesus' church is to live on the rock, the knowledge that Jesus is God's Messiah. This is our last song. It's a good fun song for children and adults too. It's called Live on the Rock. Thank you. 
nation and around the world in our worship. Now as we finish up, won't you join in and pray this prayer with me? Take us and use us to love and serve you and all people in the power of your Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of peace equip you with everything good for doing his will working in you what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Well, thank you again for watching. Please leave me a message and I'll see you next week.